This is the recap of Lecture 7 for Formal Methods. And our first topic for today is how to translate from English to a Boolean expression. So our author here in paragraph 2.5 has a three-step process. The first thing to do when you have an English sentence and you want to translate it into a Boolean expression is to introduce Boolean variables to, de to denote sub-propositions. The second step is to replace these sub-propositions by their corresponding Boolean variables. And the third step is to translate the result of step two into a Boolean expression using obvious quote unquote translations of the English words into English operators. And then he gives us a table 2.3 for examples of translations of English words. So here, let's go through each one of these and then we'll do some examples. So in table 2.3, the English word and becomes conjunction. So we've learned the truth tables for conjunction and disjunction. And so that looks like an uppercase A without the crossbar is the symbol for conjunction, which is the English word and, or becomes disjunction, which looks like a capital V, not becomes the negation operator, and furthermore, another way to say not is, in English, is, quote, it is not the case that, unquote. So when you see that phrase, that also gets translated to the word, to the negation operator. And then we have this really important one, if P then Q, that becomes in, um, as, a, as a Boolean expression, that becomes P implies Q, where the implies is this double stemmed arrow that's pointing from P to Q. All right, so here are some examples. You see, um, suppose we, we identify these sub-propositions as follows. The phrase, Henry VIII had one son. So when we see that English phrase, we are going to abbreviate that as lowercase x. So x is a variable uh, in a Boolean expression, and, and it will represent the phrase, Henry VIII had one son. Then Cleopatra had two sons. That we will abbreviate by the letter lowercase y. And then the f English phrase, I'll eat my hat, we will indicate that with uh, lowercase z and the statement one is prime we will indicate that with the lowercase letter w. Now so with these so you see what we've done here it with these in this first uh, part of the slide here we have entered we have done step one introduce boolean variables to denote sub propositions okay and so now so that we we have com completed step one all right, so we then have the following sentences and their translations. Now, see if you can translate this. If we see this statement, the English statement, Henry VIII had one son, or I'll eat my hat. How would you translate that from English into a Boolean expression? Well, Henry VIII had one son, that is the expression X. I'll eat my hat, that is the expression Z. And so the English expression becomes, oh, and they are separated by the word or, which is disjunction. So to translate Henry VIII had one son, or I'll eat my hat, that becomes X or Z. Now, how about the, ex, the English expression, Henry VIII had one son, and one is not prime. Well, here again, X is Henry VIII had one son. One is not prime one is prime would be W. So one is not prime would be not W. And they are connected with the and. So this translation would be X and not W. Okay, now here's another one. If one is prime and Cleopatra had two sons, I'll eat my hat. Now that comma there is kind of like saying Another way to say this sentence in English is, if one is prime and Cleopatra had two sons, then I'll eat my hat. So this is like an if-then. So if one is prime, that's W, and Cleopatra had two sons, that's Y, So and they're connected with and, so W and Y, 
then I'll eat my hat. So implies, and I'll eat my hat is Z. So the expression is W and Y implies Z. Okay, so um, that's uh, the general method of translating from English to Boolean expression uh, together with these three examples. Now, there is there are a, a whole host of other English expressions that unfortunately are not covered by the author of our book. And so I have here uh, some supplementary information about uh, how to do this in, in, a, in much more detail than, than, uh, than is covered in our textbook. So the first um, example here is English, I'm just labeling this English expression number one. When you see the English um, expression P comma if Q, the question is how do you translate that into a Boolean expression? Now there's two possibilities. It's either P implies Q or Q implies P. So the key idea here is that the if is in front of the Q. So this is the same thing as saying if Q then P. When you say P comma if Q you are saying if Q then P. So the translation is Q implies P. Okay, so that's the first English expression. The second one sticks in this little word only, which has a significant effect on the translation. So the expression is P comma only if Q. Now when you put that word only in there, it changes the, um, the, the meaning. So the translation of this, P only if Q, is if P then Q. Now why is that if P then Q? Here's an example. There, um, so this is not the same thing as as if P then Q. It's sorry, it's not it's not the same thing as um, as English as English expression one. For example, there is a requirement to be the president of the United States. There is a requirement in the U.S. Constitution that you must be at least 35 years old. So if you're, you know, 25 years old, you can't be the president. You have to be 35 years or older. All right, so. The English statement, you can be president only if you are at least 35 years old. So you can be president would be the P, only if is the connective. And then the phrase, you are at least 35 years old, that's the Q. So that means you, if you are president, then you are at least 35 years old. It doesn't mean if you are 35 years, at least 35 years old, then you are president. That doesn't mean that. We'd have a lot of presidents if that were the case, but we only have one. Now, if we combine these, here's English expression number three. P if and only if Q. Now, how do we parse this? Well, first of all, do you see that this is the same thing as saying P if Q and P only if Q? Well, what is P if Q? P if Q is Q implies P. And what is P only if Q? That's the same thing as if P then Q. So it's the same thing as Q implies P and P implies Q. And this turns out to be the same thing as equal veils. In other words, if P, if P then Q and if Q then P is the same thing as they are the same. Either they are, either they are both true or they are both false. And so there is a common English abbreviation for this, if and only if, and it's IFF. And this is very common in mathematics. IFF means if and only if, and it means equal veils, and it means P implies Q and Q implies P. Now there's two other very important words in English that we have to be able to translate. And these two words are sufficient and necessary. The first word here is sufficient. And this phrase is, P is a sufficient condition for Q. Now when you say P is sufficient, what do you mean? There's two possibilities. Either P implies Q or Q implies P. And so for P to be a sufficient condition for Q, it's, this is the same thing as if P then Q. 
Now, let me give uh, an example of this. Suppose that you are in, you're taking a course, and your professor says, you know what, I don't care how lax you were during the year. If you make an A on the final exam, that is sufficient. That is a sufficient condition for you to pass the course. So what we're saying then is getting an P is getting an A on the final exam. Q is passing the course. And what we're saying is that if you get an A on the final exam, then you will pass the course. Nothing else matters. P is sufficient for Q. All right? So what you're saying when you're saying P is sufficient, you're saying that if that is true, then the consequent follows. All right, now the other word is necessary. Now, so here, let's suppose uh, on, in another class you have a different professor and you're taking a, a different class and it's an English composition class or something like that. And the professor says, writing a 100 page term paper is necessary for you to pass the course. I don't care what else you got on the final. I don't care whatever other work you have done or how good it is. If you don't write a 100 page term paper, you can't pass the course. P is necessary for Q. So now the question here is, is this if P then Q or if Q then P? Well, this is obviously if Q then P. Because what this is saying is that if you pass the class, then you wrote that 100 term, that 100 page term paper. So P is necessary for Q means Q implies P. And you can remember four and five by, by the, this little um, phrase, the sufficient implies the necessary. So that's one way to remember which one is which. And then here again, we can, we can combine both of these to be an, with an and. If you say P is a necessary and sufficient condition for Q, what that means is that P is necessary for Q and P is sufficient for Q. So this obviously means both P implies Q and Q implies P. And we saw before that that's the same thing as P equals Q. All right, so the next one is whenever. Now, whenever means basically the thing to remember here is that whenever means the same thing as if. So P whenever Q is if Q then P. So this is like saying P if Q. All right, so that's the meaning of the word whenever. And provided that is, is the same thing. It's a kind of a synonym provided that. It's synonymous with uh, whenever. So P provided that Q is also if Q then P. So provided that means the same thing as if. So if you so if you say I will I will go to the movie provided that you go too, what you are saying is that if you go to the movie then I will go to the movie. Now unless has is interesting it has a, a negation involved. So let's do a little example here. Well first of all let's let me show you what what it when you say P unless Q. That's the same thing as if not Q then P. In other words, not Q implies P. And the way to see this, an example of this in English is, suppose you're shopping with your friend and you go to the store and they, they have one item left of an item that you want. And you tell your friend, I will buy it unless you do. What you are saying then is that if you do not buy it, then I will buy it. So I will buy it, that's the P, unless is the connective, and you, you buy it is the Q. So what you're saying is that if you do not buy it, then I will buy it. So that's the meaning of P unless Q. It's a little tricky because you have that negation that gets thrown in there. And now what happens is, if you say P unless not Q, now we have a not one not because of the unless, and another not in front of the Q that we have inserted in front of the Q. So what this means is, if Q then P. Now this is a little tricky, but I think you can you can see with this example. Suppose we examine, we parse the English sentence, I will take another course unless I do not pass this one. 
So what, you're taking a course, you're going to say, well, I'm going to take another course unless I do not pass this one. So I pass this one, that's the, that's the Q. And unless not is the connective, and then P is, I will take another course. So what that means is that if I pass this course, then I'll take another. So that's a, an example of how this English expression 10 uh, is translated into a Boolean expression. Now, we have some punctuation marks here also. When you see a sentence, two sentences separated by a semicolon, or two statements or two phrases separated by a semicolon. The semicolon is, means and. So this is the same thing as P and Q. All right, so there's your one punctuation. Comma means the same thing. I don't know if you noticed, but we actually used this fact in our inference rules when we had, on, we had, we had a, a comma on the top of the horizontal line of an inference rule, we, and we interpreted that as and. It is a punctuation connective, which means that, which means and. So this is the same thing as P and Q. And the word but is also the same thing. So if you say, I can do that, but so can you, that means the same thing. That means I can do that and you can do that. So that's the same, same kind of a connective that just means conjunction. Okay, now, um, there is actually a topic that um, I'm not going to go over here in this recap, but in lecture seven, we described the difference between equals and equal veils, and we covered that material in uh, the lecture five recap, so we got a little bit out of order on our topics here, but you can look at the lecture five recap for the difference between equals and equal veils. So now the next topic is propositional calculus. And so first, uh, a definition. What is a proposition? A proposition is a declarative statement that is either true or false. Okay, so that's the definition of a proposition. So an example of a proposition would be, um, the sky is blue. That is a declarative statement that happens to, to be true most of the time. Okay, and uh, Henry VIII had one son. That is another example of a proposition. It is a declarative statement that is either true or false. He either had one son or he didn't. Now, what is an axiom? An axiom is a Boolean expression that defines the properties of Boolean operators. And the important thing that we have to remember here is that axioms are never proved. They are, they are assumed to be valid. Now, do you remember what valid means? It means true in all states. So uh, that is the definition of an axiom. And then a theorem is either one, an axiom, or two, a theorem that is proved equal to an axiom or a previously proved theorem. Okay, so because theorems are proved from axioms, that means that all theorems are also valid because if axioms are assumed to be valid, then the theorems are also valid if we can show that they are equivalent to previously proved theorems or axioms. So that's the definition of a theorem. So. Axioms are theorems, but there are theorems that are not axioms. You never prove an axiom, but you have to prove a theorem. All right, so those are some definitions of propositional calculus. Now, the word calculus actually means reasoning with symbols. So, you know, the calculus that most students are familiar with is the, are, uh, is the calculus that deals with in integration and differentiation of functions. And, and that is, and you use symbols like the integral sign or the dy, <clears throat> or, the, or the symbols dy dx for the derivative. Propositional calculus is dealing with symbols, is, de, is dealing with Boolean expressions and symbols conjunction and disjunction and the other ones that we have learned. What we are going to do now is we are going to, to learn a a logic system is called calculation logic 
in which we start with a set of axioms that we assume and then we derive theorems from them. Okay, now, one way to actually prove that a Boolean expression is true in all states is to, is to write up the truth table, okay? So all of the axioms and theorems that we are going to be studying from now on, you could actually tediously prove that they are valid by calculating the Boolean expression in all possible states. But we're not, that provides no insight. That's, that's a mechanical thing and it's tedious and it, it provides no insight into the structure of the system. So from now on, we are not going to prove by truth tables. So truth tables are out. Instead, we are going to use axioms, a set of axioms that are assumed, and our set of four inference rules. Do you remember what those inference rules are? The inference rules are substitution, Leibniz, equanimity, and transitivity. And so you can re review those inference rules uh, in a previous recap. All right, so here we will start off with our first axiom, axiom 3.1. This axiom is the associativity of equivales. And what does it say? It says that if you take P equivales Q first, and then you equivale that with R, on the one hand, and then on the other hand, if you take Q equals R first, and then you do P equals that, after you do Q equals R, you get the same thing, regardless of which order that you do them in. So this is axiom associativity of equals, and we're not going to prove it. We are going to assume that it is true, because it's an axiom. Okay, and what does this allow, what does this axiom allow us to do? It allows us to write P equals Q equals R. Now you remember one of the differences between equals and equals is that equals is associative. So the associativity of equals is our very first axiom. And so it allows us to write P equals Q equals R without parentheses. So if you see the expression P equals Q equals R, you are allowed to put the parentheses around the P equals Q first and then equal that with R, or you are allowed to put the parentheses around the Q equals R so that you do that first and then, you, and then after that you do P equals that expression. So basically what you should remember is that because of this axiom, when you have a string of equals, you, you don't have to put the parentheses, you don't have to say where the parentheses go because they can go anywhere you want for them. Any, anywhere you want them to go. All right, now the second axiom, which we are also not going to prove, but we are going to assume. We are going to assume that P equals Q is the same thing as Q equals P. So that, that is a, that is, um, that's what we mean by symmetry. It doesn't matter, you can, see, you can do P equals Q or you can do Q equals P. Now look, this 3.2 axiom does not have any parentheses in it. Why not? Because axiom 1 that we looked at before says that you can put the parentheses anywhere you want. So what does that mean? That means that there's many ways, many different ways to interpret this axiom. We can put the parentheses anywhere. A common way to interpret axiom 3.2 is to put the parentheses around the P equals Q on the left and then around the Q equals P on the right, as we have in this first example. But because you can put them anywhere you want, it's equally valid, or it's equally legal to put the parentheses around the first three variables and have open paren P equals Q equals Q close paren and then have that being equal to P. Or you could put the parentheses around the middle. You could say, put the P equals, and then open paren, Q equals Q, close paren, and then equals P. In which case you would be doing the Q equals Q first. I guess there's one more here that we didn't um, notice, but that we didn't uh, notate. But another possibility is to have P equals open paren, Q equals Q, equals P, close paren. So you can put the parentheses anywhere. So basically what we're saying here is that the way to use axiom 
is to recognize that when you have a string of equal values, you can put the parentheses anywhere you want. So you can drop them and insert them as at will. Okay, so we will continue this uh, with the next lecture. See you next time.